Hi, and welcome to the inaugural Modern Retina Street Team Facebook Live event. With us, we have an esteemed panel of retina experts here to give us their insights as to what went on in 2017 and what they're looking forward to in 2018. Can, if you can take a couple of minutes to introduce yourselves, that would be great. Dr. Brown? Sure, I'm David Brown from Houston, Texas, uh, part of Retina Consultants of Houston. Charles Wyckoff, uh, Houston, Texas, Retina Consultants of Houston. Rick Spade from New York, uh, the Vitius Retina Macular Consultants of New York. Rishi Singh from Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Great, well welcome everyone and thank you again for taking the time to share with us your thoughts on what happened in uh, 2017, so let's get started. Um, if you could come up with one or two things that you thought were the most exciting to happen in retina in 2017, what would they be and why? Sure, I think one of the most exciting things is we've been talking about gene therapy forever. Uh, we finally have a gene therapy that works in ophthalmics with Spark, uh, with con Labor's congenital amaurosis. It's really pushed a lot of other gene therapy companies, Regenex Bio and Adverum, to move forward to human trials. It's exciting. I mean, we've we hopefully targeted gene therapy is going to be the way uh, of the future. Yeah, I think about that in two, two bags. I think of things that are going to be clinically useful in the short term and then things that sort of from a research perspective are exciting long term. I think clinically useful in the short term, I think SCORE2 had some really useful data for clinical practice. And I think that the brolicizumab data, the early release of that data, suggests that we might have a new clinical product for wet AMD treatment in the very near future. From a research perspective, I think dry AMD, GA to me, is still the biggest unmet need in my patient population. And so the lampalizumab data was a, was a huge hit for the negative, but then of course you have complement inhibition with the Philly trial, which showed possibly some light for patients. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> So light for patients. Uh, the thing I, to me, is most impressive is really the continued development in OCT and geography. Uh, that started out as a kind of a novelty that was not that clinically useful, and now we do OCT and geography in maybe half our patients. It's such an easy thing to do, and we see a lot. And we integrate that with a lot of different diseases that you wouldn't necessarily think of. I, we do end up doing imaging for some glaucoma people in our area. And the one thing you notice is there's really a poor structure function correlate between, say, OCT measurements of the nerve fiber layer and the visual field. But with greater imaging, we start seeing in the radial peripapillary capillary network, OCT and geography, we're able to pick out the ganglion cell layer, which is in the macula. And it, as it turns out, glaucoma really is kind of a macular disease. Uh, I'm learning more about OCT and geography from Rick Spade because he's, been, he's contributed a lot to the field. And in general, I think he's right. I think more of these technologies are gonna help us process this data in an effective fashion. So uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning has really, I think, become one of the forefronts of the, of the research field this year. Um, some of those products might even be available as early as next year in various devices. And so either home device uh, materials that are gonna be available for patients, also things that are gonna be bur burnt into our camera systems that would help us better predict and determine disease states. And I think that's really taken off this year from a variety of different people. And think people you wouldn't even potentially think as pharma companies like Google being involved in a product like this now. So that uh, for me has been a really impressive development I think this year. So before we move on to, to things that we're looking forward Google, to now. Google can tell your like short term mortality risk from cardiovascular disease from your fundus photograph. Besides knowing your gender and. Which is amazing. All yeah. sorts of, if you have so hypertension or not, if you smoke or not, on, yeah. holy mackerel. So is OCTA the final frontier in imaging, do you guys think? I think th if I go back to that glaucoma thing where you look at the radial peripapillary capillary network, which actually might be in some ways better than nerve fiber layer and look at the ganglion cell layer, all of these things are gonna be a little bit too hard, I think, to us to integrate together. And just like Rishi said, I think it's gonna to be to a point where a computer is gonna be telling us these things. We'll get these different tests. It'll be kind of not multimodal imaging, that sense, it's multi, or I don't know, a systems-wide kind of thing. And then we'll put this information and it'll tell us five-year risk for going downhill or for losing field or for having AMD convert over to wet or something like that. I think it's gonna be like that. And, in Excellent. the upcoming future. Yeah. Excellent. And, and bouncing off of what you said, Dr. Brown, um, so gene therapy, do you think that uh, LCA, uh, the work that's being done in that and with Spark, because um, now they're also looking at L, uh, LHON as well, is, is, are those going to be the, those where the gene therapy is going to take root, so to speak? So you, or, sort of, you sort of have two pathways in right. gene therapy. You sort of have, let's fix something miss, missing that's inherited. 
And then the other pathway is, can we make a viral vector, create a factory to create a Leo or Lucentis or another anti-VEGF? And so we have, with Regenex Bio and Adverum, human clinical trials where it's making that factory. Uh, with Spark uh, and with some others, we're looking at uh, Labor's congenital amaurosis, you're looking at uh, Stargardt's disease, you're looking at uh, uh, X-linked juvenile retinoschisis, things where you have a missing protein that filling in what's been gone wrong uh, in the pathway may either reverse or at least stop the disease progression from that point. Dave, I know this is a guess, but what do you think this is going to cost? So the, the problem with costing is... RP65, we're going to put the virus in. Yeah. It's going to last a couple, three years. How yeah, much? It's, it's, it's very challenging to say. I mean, if you look at it, the average patient needs seven, eight injections at 2,000 a pop. They're going to probably project that out to two years and say this thing's worth 28 grand, right? Uh, whether an insurer is willing to do that, that's another question. Yeah. Yeah, this is the problem we deal with a lot in medicine now is the cost of care of these drugs. And so... If we ever go to a capitated environment, especially with our AMD situation, we're going to have a hard time justifying our cost of, these, of the care of these patients, especially given the fact that we're also evaluating these patients with cardiovascular mortality and issues like that that we're having to balance their costs against, too. So uh, at our organization in particular, we've really focused on trying to reduce the cost of care of our patients this year. And so we did a lot of maneuvers, which were really simple stuff, just compounding eye drops in for surgery rather than using bottles for every patient, made a huge difference in our operating rooms as far as cost goes. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of those things happen in the upcoming years, especially with our patients, especially with the changeover in insurance plans and whatever the Republicans have in store for us from a new insurance plan coming down the pike soon may change us upside, uh, upside down again for and us. biosimilars are coming out? Yeah. Yeah, Rishi, I absolutely agree. But I think the challenge with that, with the clinical trial data that we have, is that I think people be, take data and they compare it to drugs that are maybe different. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to have data with the same drugs that you might be using clinically, but if the data is different, we need to take that into, into account. I think yeah. people gloss over that. That you know, score two, awesome trial, great data, but again, the Avastin there is a different form of Avastin than I get in my clinic on a daily basis, and so I'm left with making a decision on incomplete data, and so it's challenging to make cost comparisons when we're comparing apples to oranges. Yeah, and hopefully that will become a little bit easier when you have, you know, Avastin is coming off label, I believe, in 2000, uh, 2020, uh, and is hitting off patent then, so there will be biosimilars available for that very shortly. I know there are co different companies involved in that this process. So maybe that, yeah. Charlie, your, your concern is a really important one, because I think we live in this world where we think the same drug is coming out of the trial that's in our practice, and for us, we do it in a hospital, so we feel pretty comfortable about that. But uh, I think, as Dave has said, if it's delivered on the, uh, you said the dashboard of a Buick being delivered to your office, I think is what you, how you term, termed it at one point, um, that's a different quality drug that, that, uh, that might be delivered to somebody's practice versus being delivered in a hospital so environment. And biosimilar, Avastin is not going to change that. Yeah. Well, in what way? Because you would imagine that they would use, you know, still, no, good, still good clinical practice and licensed pharmacies and everything else. No, it's else. all about fill and, there's no fill and, it's really hard to find fill and finish formularies. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the difference. Then you can right? trust. Yeah. And you have and, some kind of way to check up on what they're doing. And at this point, yeah. Medicare doesn't pay you enough to use a fill and finish formulary. Yeah. You know, to put it under a glass vial under nitrogen is probably 150 bucks a dose. Yeah. Which is way cheaper than our branded anti-VEGFs. But Medicare pays you 73 bucks a dose. Yeah. So who's going to take a $77 hit to, right? Yep. Right. So if you're to give cat tile drugs. So if you're yep. not affiliated with an academic institution or a hospital, how do so you go about evaluating it? What, as you were saying, you know, the, the sure. Buick driver that comes calling on your. So the FDA now has some uh, uh, some uh, accreditation of these compounding pharmacies. Certainly encourage uh, whoever's to all retina physicians to figure out where their drug's coming from. Don't necessarily take the lowest, cheapest price. You want somebody who does it a lot, who is under these FDA regulations. You still have other issues. They're all put into plastic syringes. There's noted reports of aggregation of proteins. There's degradation of that drug over time. Yeah. It, it's not the same drug. If you're getting fresh drug that's compounded weekly by the Cleveland Clinic Pharmacy, I think you're pretty safe because you don't have that long for, you know when it's coming down. Yeah. Uh, you know, the born-in date, like on the beers, 
you really kind of need that on Avastin, and they don't give you that. They give you an expiration date. But the challenge with that is if you, as soon as a drug touches plastic, it changes. I don't think it's, it's partially independent of the time that it's sitting in the plastic. That's true. They just show that it degrades right away. So unless you're comparing it to a glass vial delivered Avastin in clinic, I think it's hard to, it's hard to say that they're the same, regardless of how long it's in plastic. So Rishi, when you say you feel more comfortable because it's in a hospital setting, what, what does that mean? Well, I think, you know, there's uh, the delivery of drug doesn't take a, a long, circuitous route to get to us. We have uh, people that are compounding uh, cancer drugs at the same time uh, who are well versed at doing this sort of thing. But I, I agree. I think even in our environment, we have some skepticism as far as what the effectiveness is, whether there's issues. And by the way, we've also had the same issue with uh, silicone oil uh, in, those, in those drugs, too. So. Uh, you know, those are the, the, the toughest patients to take care of, especially after the fact when you have that sort of situation happen. And I totally agree. It's not an immune environment, but it's, it's certainly, um, you know, I think hopefully we'll have something better for everyone to use, not just we're, one place. We're operating on the assumption that each one of these pharmacies is just taking the Avastin purely out of the vial or whatever like that. But, you know, there were published studies where people looked at the protein content of the, what was injected and it had yeah. zero protein. That's water. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. All right. So moving on to what you're planning on, uh, or what you would think at this point in time, anticipating will be the big news of 2018 here at Retina So Specialty Day. What are you What are you guys most looking forward to to hearing on the podium or um, seeing in uh, you know in the exhibit hall or what have you? So two things. One to tout Charlie's uh, uh, Charlie next door. We've got. Uh, We've got the data from Hulk, which is mm -hmm. a super choroidal steroid delivery, first time uh, uh, data in di di diabetic macular edema. Yep. Uh, that's coming out, same session. You have uh, the Brolixizumab data coming out more than the, what there is in the press release with mm -hmm. Pravi and Dougal. I think that's gonna be an exciting yeah, session. Also Protocol U is in that same yep. Same mm -hmm. Protocol U is yep. in the same section. Mm -hmm. So the, the first time clinical results section is certainly, I think it's four to five tomorrow, it's gonna be. Yeah. Sort Good of the stuff. hot ticket. I would even add the add the uh, Pellis Philly data to that. Yeah. Yep. So there's a lot of new trial data that's really exciting. Yeah, David Boyer's business. presenting that. I mean, the difficulty we're going to have is all those are five minute presentations, and lampalizumab's in that same section. Yep. You know, the, the they didn't want to talk at first. So I, that took a little baking. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to present. You know, they, they have half their doing, data out, yeah. and I think they're in their heart of hearts. They're hoping that the European data will reverse it all. I think that's right. unlikely, but Possibly. but then they would only have to do another study. They won't know what to do. They, they've, they've got a lot of, they've got, their bar tab is pretty high on that study. So. Yeah, they, they gave a good try. You know, that's, that's the tough part about um, the data that was released initially. When, when they'd released the one trial data, I think people lost a lot of hope. And we've all seen studies where you've seen two phase threes go either way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was uh, trying to um, maybe hopefully in a proper way reassure my patients because they were in the other trial that wasn't finished up yet. And so we hope, you know, hope the data was going to be a little bit more positive in that case. But there, you know, in dry eye, this actually happened just recently with Shire's drug, yeah. where they had three phase three clinical trials before they hit hit the final endpoints mm -hmm. that he did. So um, maybe we're at that. And regardless, I think we're going to learn a lot from this right. study, from a natural history basis, and also from a treatment basis, what this all means to us. And, I think and subgroup analysis after subgroup analysis after yeah. subgroup analysis yeah, may I, I, weed it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think the coolest thing they have in that, they have total human genome mapping on 90%. Yeah. Not just the eye genes, they have stem to stern genome mapping. Yeah. So the analysis of uh, phenotypic variations to different genes, if they do it right, we could really learn a lot from the gene studies. Yeah. I think besides the drugs, I'd also come back to Rick's point that I think if you look at the number of talks in subspecialty today, the biggest thing being talked about is OCT and geography mm -hmm. by far. So imaging is real hot as ever. And I think people are still trying to learn how to incorporate OCTA. You know, you have leaders like Rick that's been doing this for years and use it on all patients. And then you have people like me that use it occasionally to differentiate certain disease states. But I think the rest of us really need to learn how to, how to incorporate this on a daily basis. And I think especially today is going to help people do that. And there's a lot more surgical stuff this year. You look at it, almost the first half day is uh, surgery stuff. I think with uh, pharmacological uh, drugs, lampalizumab and others sort of not being big news, it sort of pushed surgery to the forefront, and most of us, that's what we love to do. So, yeah. signing stuff with ILM flaps and uh, uh, different types of imaging, thing. you know, yeah. heads up imaging. And, mm -hmm. yeah. ILM flaps work. Yep. 
That's a kind of exciting thing for us. You have a high myope with a detachment because of a macular hole. That was, I hated those cases. Yeah, right. and I, I've, been, I've been a convert from 3D head subsurgery this year, and I would never go back. <laughs> uh, That's and a I, ringing endorsement. And, and I think it's just, uh, it's, it's going to keep me operating into my 50s and 60s because of that technology. That old. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us got to work right <laughs> So, you know, the, the reality of this, that, that, is, that, that technology is that it just really improves, I think, the visualization and depth of field. And it's really improved, I think, the ability to teach people while you operate, too, which is huge in our practice. So um, showing them on a screen with a mouse and pointing to things has been really, really key and helpful to encouraging their education over time. The other angle of the imaging that there's a lot of discussion about is the ultra-wide field imaging. So yeah. we're still learning what the periphery shows. There's a few really good talks on uh, reperfusion, the issue of what happens when you dose diabetics with, with areas that are not perfused with anti-VEGF agents. Can you, can you change that trajectory of perfusion? Can you get reperfusion? Do you just slow the progression of non-perfusion? What does that mean? I think we have a lot to learn in that regard. Yeah, what does reperfusion mean, really? Yeah, in my it hands, I don't see it very often. And yet, it's, it's talked about a we lot. You can reperfuse your brain after it's not been used for a while. And does so it doesn't work. Right. It don't Absolutely. work so good, yeah. So it's yeah. not, it, a lot of people think it's revascularization, right? Yeah. And it's not. It's not like dead retina and you suddenly get a scaffolding and new vessels growing. Yeah, like ROP. Yeah, you yeah. certainly see in very small areas uh, of, of, at the penumbra where you have non perfusion, maybe due to hypo perfusion or whatever, if you increase the blood pressure, they can see more. It's been described before VEGF. Uh, uh, but it's interesting. It certainly yeah. changed, certainly anti-VEGF changes the diabetic milieu in the eye. They need less injections over time. It's doing something good for the eye other than anti-permeability. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't trying to be critical. I was just trying to ask you guys because you're smart guys. Well, and I, <laughs> you did the Dave study. <laughs> and, I, and I think, of course, that's where we're all changed this year. A lot of us, I think, on the panel, uh, basically we're using anti-VEGF as a, as a therapy for mm -hmm. patients with severe NPDR or even PDR at times. Uh, with the results of Protocol S last year, I think we really got a lot of good data from that. Mm -hmm. And that's really reassured us as far as what we can do with patients in clinic and how we can use anti-VEGFs to stave off laser and stave off the other sort of things we were doing over time. Although I'm, I gotta address that directly though, I totally agree with you, absolutely. I just, I, I worry though that people are over-interpreting Protocol S and, and finding that it replaces laser. I really think that we should look more towards the combination route. Yeah. Certainly less aggressive laser maybe, but laser is a fantastic safety blanket for the patients that may not be complying. Because unfortunately I have a lot of those patients in my clinic. Yep. Some of the people involved with that protocol though were in a strong cell for giving the anti-VEGF and not combining. Right. I, I think, I think that's maybe a disservice. I think it's been a disservice. World, yeah. I agree. Yeah, and I think it's for the high risk patient, right? You're not doing this on the Absolutely. patient with mild or moderate NPDR. It's patients with severe NPDR. We're giving the biggest bang for your buck for that. Yeah. And I think all of us, you know, can pretty much agree. If you were a diabetic and having that sort of state, we could potentially. I mean, it's it's rare when therapies actually augment the disease state to regress it. You know, you, cancer is always with you. When you have a heart attack, you always are a heart patient. You continually have, you know dyskinesis of the, of the atrium or the ventricles because of that condition, can you actually reverse retinopathy and actually keep it off? The answer is pretty close to being yes. And so that's a, a very unique thing, I think, in ophthalmology, again, for us to see. Great. Any last comments? No, all right. Well, then I want to remind everyone that we will have a second Facebook Live event on Saturday. Please stay tuned for dates and time, or for the time. And uh, thank you all for your participation in this inaugural Modern Retina Street Team. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.